want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. We've been in the book of Proverbs for a few weeks now, and we've been talking about wisdom and, and walking with the wise. The book of Proverbs is one of several books in the Bible that are referred to as books of wisdom. And I don't know about you, but boy, I could sure use some wisdom in my life. And I think as we look around in the world that we live in today, we would agree that there is a serious shortage of wisdom. But you know what? There's a book. There's several books that are available in the Bible. Really, the whole thing is filled with all kinds of wisdom, and it's right there, and it's available to us. All we have to do is to be willing to look into it. There's a story about a, this is just a little story about a man who came home from a long day of work, and the first thing he did was what he did pretty much every evening. Came home, began his favorite evening ritual of reading the newspaper. He sat down in his easy chair, opened up the newspaper, and basically shut himself off from the rest of the world for 30 minutes, an hour, who knows. But shortly, his son came in and asked, Dad, who made God? The dad barely acknowledged the question. He says, I don't know, son. And after a few seconds of silence, the son had another question, and he said, Dad, why is the earth round? And the dad, again, not even looking up from the paper, he just said, I, I, don't, I don't know, son. And the boy entertained himself for another minute or so, and then he had another question. He said, Dad, is there life on other planets? And again, the dad just answered with a sigh. I, I don't know, son. And finally, the boy asked his father, he says, Dad, do you mind me asking you all these questions? And the, it was then that the dad put the paper away, took the paper down, put it away, and he looked at his son. He says, of course not, son. How are you ever going to learn anything? <laughs> You know, unlike this little boy, we have the opportunity to sit at the feet of the wisest man who ever lived as he imparts wisdom to us. So let's read together in Proverbs chapter 4. Solomon says, Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. When I was a boy in my father's house, still tender and only a child of my mother, and the only child of my mother, he taught me and said, lay hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or swerve from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. Wisdom is supreme. Therefore, get wisdom. Though it cost you all you have, get understanding. Esteem her and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honor you. She will set a garland of grace on your head and present you with a crown of splendor. Listen, my son, accept what I say and the years of your life will be many. I guide you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it, is with, for it is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way, for they cannot sleep until they do evil. They are robbers, robbed of slumber until they make someone fall. They eat the bread of wickedness, and drink the wine of violence. The path of righteousness is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. But the day of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. 
Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to a man's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet and only take ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. You know, chapter four in Proverbs is just another example of Solomon's desire to share wisdom with his children. Even when we began at the very beginning of this book, Solomon, it was clear that he was writing these words for his son, for his sons, multiple, a plural that he uses in this text, that he was interested in sharing his wisdom with his children. Those of you who are parents, you know how hard it is to watch your children make mistakes. You know how hard it is to watch them make bad decisions and to make a mess of their lives. But you know, when for honest, we all did similar things when we were younger, and even at our ages, we still tend to make bad decisions and sometimes can really make a mess of things. Our parents would probably say the same thing about us, for sure. We'd much rather our children avoid the mistakes that we made. We'd much rather them learn from our mistakes instead of making their own. So no matter how much you try to teach and advise and guide, they always end up doing something that ultimately makes their life harder than it has to be. Sometimes they just have to learn the hard way. But like I said, we all have been there. The verses we just read remind me of a parent who is begging and pleading with their children to listen to good advice. The reason we feel so strongly about the wisdom that we're handing down is because we have life experience. We know how easy it is to fall into evil's Tracks, and we want our kids to have a better life than we did. We want to leave a legacy. And if we really knew what was best, we'd want to leave a wisdom's legacy. You see, our text today can be divided up into basically three sections in which Solomon describes a proven legacy, a perverted legacy, and a pure legacy legacy as he himself begs and pleads with his own children to listen to good advice. So let's dig into these three sections. First of all, in verses 1 through 13, we see that Solomon is talking about a proven legacy. He begins this text or these verses with just say, listen, my sons. He uses the plural there. He's talking to his children in just a little bit. We'll talk about how many children he might be talking about. But you might be surprised to know it's not just two or three. <laughs> He's talking to a lot of kids. He's talking to us even today. Solomon affirms that his teaching is sound. It's reliable. It's proven. He knows it because he has proven it to be true. He has lived it out for himself and he knows that it's to be true. If you look in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse, uh, verse 13, Solomon just comes to this one conclusion after he lays out all these different experiences that he has had in life. At the end of the whole book of Ecclesiastes, he says, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. Solomon just kind of wraps it up in a nutshell. He says, hey, I've lived a lot of life in these years. I have gone through a lot of different things. I have experienced a lot of different things. I have put myself in a lot of different situations, some intentionally and some unintentionally. And he says, but here's one thing I know. It all boils down to this. Fear God and keep his 
commandments. You know, if we can walk out of here not hearing anything else today, if we hear that and learn how to apply that to our lives, I can promise you that your life will be better. I can promise you that managing your money will be better. I can promise you that your relationships with other people will be better. God has a plan for every part of your life. And if we fear God and keep his commandments, we're going to experience a much, much better life. Solomon says, hey, this is a proven legacy, not just because of my own experience, but also because of my father's experience. In verses 3 through 9, he recounts the things that he was taught by his father. Who was Solomon's father? King David. King David. Solomon's father was King David, who started out as the youngest of eight brothers. David was a shepherd boy, fighting off and killing lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, I, I, I don't know if there were tigers or not, but, uh, and other predators as he protected the flock of sheep he was shepherding. We most, we most recognize David because of the story of David and Goliath. It was interesting as I was listening to some of the football games yesterday and the commentators kept referring to David and Goliath's scenarios because there were some really strong, powerful teams playing some really small, not so powerful teams. And they kept uh, referring to this David and Goliath scenario. But we know that David explained, exploded onto the scene as a, a teenager when he killed Goliath after no one else in the whole army of Israel would even dare to face him. He was appointed king as a young man, but his reign was marked by constant war with his enemies and conspiracies even from within his own ranks. He spent several years on the run from his predecessor, who was King Saul. And David led the fight in many battles and wars during his reign. Even his own son, Absalom, had tried to overthrow him. And yet through it all, David trusted God. David understood the importance of God's wisdom in his life. David even became known as a man after God's own heart. And David passed down the things that he had learned about wisdom to his son, Solomon. David had experienced and had proven the legacy of wisdom. And then in verses 10 through 13, verse 10 starts out with basically the same way verse 1 started out. This is the second time Solomon implores his children to listen. Listen, my sons. Solomon assures his children that the things that he is teaching is true, that he is a father who cares for his children. He only wants what is best for them, and he would never, ever seek to lead them in a way that would destroy them or that would harm them. He wants them to know that they can count on the instruction and that he's giving them and that wisdom would guide them through a long life with no regrets. Wisdom's legacy is a proven legacy. But wisdom's legacy can be contrasted with a perverted legacy. In these verses, in verses 14 through 19, Solomon had another proven legacy in his life. As great and as wise as Solomon was, he will also always be known for a part of his life that was less than righteous, to say the least. In fact, there were times when Solomon was downright humanistic, materialistic, and even hedonistic in his lifestyle. Again, in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon records his pursuit of knowledge and accomplishment and wealth and pleasure. 
The book of 1 Kings tells us that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines in his harem. I don't know how wise that is. <laughs> These influences in his life led him to worship other gods. Even the wisest man that ever lived can make stupid decisions. And that will affect, or it has affected his legacy even still today. But he also learned from those experiences. And in verses 14 through 19 of our text, he offers wisdom to help his children avoid the bad decisions that he made. Notice I said bad decisions and not mistakes. You know the difference between the two? Mistakes are accidental. Bad decisions are intentional. How often do we want to come to God and say, I made a mistake when we really were intentional about it? We really meant to do what we knew was wrong and we knew better. Solomon strongly encourages or discourages his children from engaging in evil and wickedness. He points out how evil, wicked people are driven by their appetite for more and more evil and wickedness. They can't rest. They can't sleep. They're always hungry and thirsty for more. Solomon knows because he's speaking from his own experience. This also, even though it's a perverted legacy, he's saying this too is a proven legacy. Solomon draws that stark contrast between the righteous living in the light and the wicked stumbling around in darkness, and they don't even know what's causing them to trip because they can't see. They can't figure it out. Why is, not, why is life not working out for me? Why does everything have to be so hard? And we're just, a lot of times we get to a point walking in the darkness where we're just willing to accept that this is the way life has to be. I think Solomon, God's word, and God holy, and through his Holy Spirit right now is just crying out to us. It doesn't have to be that way. Jesus said, in this world, yes, you will have trouble. But he says, I have overcome this world. I am here to give you wisdom so that you will know how to face these challenging situations. I hope that even as Solomon had a proven legacy of wisdom, we see that he also had a proven legacy of perversion. And yet through that all, wisdom overcame Wisdom sustained him, and it can do the same for us. The third section of this, this scripture is uh, Proverbs 20, I'm sorry, verses 20 through 27, a pure legacy. Solomon describes a pure legacy, and right there in verse 20, Solomon starts out again the same way he did in the first two sections. He says, listen, this is the third time that he calls his children to listen and he stresses the importance of this instruction and he invites them to just lean in, listen, make sure you get this. He instructs his children to keep their hearts pure. The Bible says some interesting thing about, things about our hearts. In Philippians chapter four, verses seven and eight, it says, and the peace of God will, that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Then it goes on to say, how do we go about guarding our hearts? In verse eight, it says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Focus on these things. Get rid of all those other things that are going to lead you down those paths of evil 
and wickedness. Just go ahead and put them away and focus on these things, the truth, what is noble, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable. If we want to keep our hearts pure, there's a checklist right there. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Solomon also instructs his children to keep their mouths clean. To keep their mouths clean. There's a, a, an occurrence in Matthew chapter 15 where Jesus is debating the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are criticizing the disciples of Jesus because they didn't wash their hands before they ate. This was a ceremonial thing. It's not that they were eating with dirty hands, but there was this ceremonial ritual that they had to go through in order to be ceremonial, ceremonially clean before they ate. And so the Pharisees are calling them out on it and saying, Jesus, you sure guys, they're eating with unclean hands. The truth of the matter is that the Pharisee, the Pharisees, they were more worried about somebody's clean hands than they were a clean heart. They were worried about what was going in the mouth. They weren't worried about what was happening, as we talked about earlier, in the heart. Matthew chapter 15, verse 18, Jesus says that the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart. And that's what defiles a man. What comes out of the heart. Whatever is in our heart. We want to guard our hearts because whatever is in our heart is going to be reflected in what comes out of our mouth. Again, I'm going to go back through the list. Guard your heart. Focus on whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. Anything excellent or praiseworthy. The psalmist in Psalm 19, verse 14 says, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord my rock and my redeemer. In verse 25, Solomon instructs his children to keep their eyes focused. We've already talked about the heart. How can we guard our heart? We got to realize that the mouth reveals what's in our heart. We also have to realize that if we keep our eyes focused in the right place, it's a great way to guard our heart. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says that we can fix our eyes on Jesus who is the author and the finisher. This translation says he is the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. It begins and it is sustained and it ends with Jesus. He is the one who sustains our faith. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 says that we should Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And then it goes on to tell us that everything else we need will be added unto us. We don't have to worry about what we're going to eat or what we're going to wear or where we're even going to live. Seek first his righteousness and his kingdom and everything else will be taken care of. Everything else will be added to us. In verses 26 and 27, Solomon just emphasizes the importance and the diligence necessary in following wisdom. We talk, talked about the mistakes versus the bad decisions and how there's a lot of intentionality behind a bad decision. Yeah, well, we have to be just as intentional in pursuing wisdom. We don't accidentally acquire wisdom. We don't just stumble into it. We have to be intentional in acquiring wisdom. You don't have to be super intelligent or famous or even powerful like King Solomon to leave a legacy of wisdom. I'd be surprised if anybody in this room recognized the name Edward Kimball. But every one of you is familiar with his legacy. During the 19th century, Edward Kimball was a Sunday school teacher who decided to take the Great Commission 
seriously and he shared his faith with a shoe store clerk. And he led that shoe store clerk to Christ. And that man's name was D.L. Moody. Some of you may not even recognize that name, but during the 19th century, D.L. Moody grew up to become a great preacher whose ministry continues to have an impact around the world today. You can go right now to Chicago and visit the Moody Bible Institute that has trained thousands and thousands of men and women for ministry over the years. Some of you might even ride around in your car and listen to the Moody Radio Network and listen to some great programming, teaching, to help you grow in your walk with Jesus. D.L. Moody, that's just a part of his legacy. One time D.L. Moody was preaching in English, in England, and a young man named F.B. Meyer responded to the gospel, and he himself went on to become a great preacher. F.B. Meyer came over to the United States and he preached on college campuses. And it was during this preaching tour that Meyer was used to convert a student to Christ named Wilbur Chapman. None of these names sound familiar, do they? Wilbur Chapman attended one of D.L. Moody's meetings in Chicago and he became D.L. Moody's co-worker. Wilbur Chapman employed an ex-baseball player as his assistant, whose name was Billy Sunday. Oh, some people are starting to nod their heads now. You see, Billy Sunday also became a great evangelist, and he preached in Charlotte, North Carolina, at a meeting organized by the Billy Sunday Layman's Evangelistic Club, which later became known as the Christian Businessmen's Committee. You know, in the past, we've supported our local Christian businessmen's group. The Christian Businessmen's Committee invited evangelist Mordecai Ham to Charlotte to preach in the tent meeting where Billy Graham was saved. And as you know, Billy Graham has proclaimed the gospel to millions and millions and millions of people across the globe. The, the globe. Many lives have been changed forever. And perhaps yours is even one of them. All of this that I just read through came about because of one man, Edward Kimball. One man's willingness to share his faith while buying a pair of shoes in a shoe store. I want to offer one thought of an application before we close. You see, Solomon, we talked about earlier, had 700 wives, most of whom were of royal descent, the Bible tells us. You see, Solomon married the daughters of kings from all over the region and all over the world. Because when a, a king of one country married a, a princess or a, some member of the royal family from another country, it was kind of like this peace treaty had been established between the two countries. They were now family, and they, so they respected one another, and they, they lived at peace with one another. So think about this. When Solomon is writing these words of wisdom to his children, how many children could we be talking about? Think about this. How far could Solomon's influence be going? So much farther than just the boundaries and the borders of Israel. Now, I'm not recommending that anybody run out and begin marrying a bunch of different spouses, okay? That's not what I'm, not what I'm saying here. But I do want us to get what I do want us to get, and I want us to understand that God has an extended vision for you. You see, he has extended wisdom to you so that your influence can extend beyond maybe just your biological family. Right here in our own community, 
we have people of all ages, not just children, but they're everywhere. People who are in need of someone who will be willing to share their faith, to impart some wisdom into their lives. Can you begin to imagine the legacy that wisdom will leave if we are willing to implore others the same way that Solomon implores his children? We've learned today that wisdom's legacy is a proven legacy. It's been tried and it has stood the test of time. That's true for Solomon, but it's also true for many of us in this room. We have tried and proven the legacy of wisdom. And if we continue to learn and apply wisdom, if we experience and prove it for ourselves, then wisdom's legacy will guide us. It will guard us from a perverted legacy and it will lead us toward a pure legacy. A legacy that we can be proud to hand down to the next generation and in the generations to come. All for God's glory. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you share your wisdom with us through Solomon, a man who was the wisest man on earth, and yet we even see that he had his own struggles. He made his own bad decisions. But Lord, he knew a proven wisdom. He knew a proven legacy. And even though he also had a perverted legacy, Lord, wisdom's legacy is pure. So, Father, I pray that you would help us, each and every one of us, to be able to leave a proven and pure legacy in spite of those parts of our lives that may have been perverted. And Father, I pray that you will challenge each and every one of us with these words that we've heard today. We may never be a Billy Graham on a stage in a stadium with hundreds of thousands of people and millions more listening on radio or watching on TV, but we can just be one simple person while buying shoes in a shoe store, sharing our faith, sharing wisdom, with a world that so desperately needs to hear it. Those of us who are parents, Lord, help us to understand and embrace the responsibility of imparting wisdom to our children so that we can leave wisdom's legacy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. I hope you have a great week. Enjoy this beautiful fall day, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. By the way, the children will be having choir practice after the service. They will be having choir practice after the service, and I, if I'm not mistaken, I think they have some pizza on the way, too. So, <laughs> so I just wanted to make sure people knew that. Is there a big long, sort of comparisonistic long coming to church? Because we need to talk to them. Okay. Is their first meeting? Okay. All right, so parents and children and choir practice, we just need to meet with you briefly. God bless you guys. Have a great day.